do it. So, sexual or asexual reproduction, how do living things reproduce? So with sexual reproduction, um, first thing that you need to know is that it is reproduction with two parents. By the way, you should have taken your notebook home. If you didn't take your notebook home, just grab some paper and we can shove it in your notebook um, when we get back to school or whatever. Um, it's helpful to write this down somewhere if you can. So sexual reproduction is reproduction with two parents. Pretty basic, right? Uh, and that is in contrast to asexual reproduction, which you may already know or you may be able to guess. It involves just one parent. There's a lot of different ways that this can happen. Um, and we're going to talk about some of those ways today. It's pretty interesting. Living things do some very interesting things. Um, that's why I love talking about this. So sexual is two parents. Asexual is just one parent. Okay, so offspring are different from a parent. Does this apply to sexual or asex asexual reproduction? Well, I usually say, let's think about ourselves, humans. We all know that we were produced sexually. We have a mom and a dad. We have two parents. Do we look exactly identical to our parents? Some of us probably look pretty close. Some of us might look kind of close. Um, but chances are you don't actually look identical because... You're a mixture of two different genes, uh, two different sets of genes. So if offspring are different from their parent, that means sexual reproduction. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if you are identical to your parent, then that means, sorry, <laughs> actually, Mr. K just texted me. Weird, right? Um, if you are identical to your parent, that means you're reproduced asexually because you only have one set of genes uh affecting what you look like right uh produces offspring can you reproduce offspring both sexually or asexually yes so both now again if you're doing the venn diagram you you just filled in a couple things there right sorry i'm trying to make sure my phone doesn't go off again I'm getting distracted here oh. okay sorry so apple trees we need to think about, do they reproduce sexually, asexually, or both? Um, usually in class, this is the point where I would have you raise your hands to take a vote, and I would probably tell you all that you are wrong um, because they reproduce both ways. Um, they reproduce sexually through their flowers. We talked before about how flowers are sexual organs. Um, and then they also reproduce asexually through a thing called vegetative propagation. Now. Being that this is underlined, that probably means that's something you should write down. That's usually a good clue, right? So you might want to write down vegetative propagation. Or um, if you have the printer, that's going to be filled in on your sheet. So let's talk about what vegetative propagation is. Oh, and I gave you a specific um, instance of grafting. We're going to talk a little bit about grafting. There's a couple different types of vegetative propagation that we're going to talk about. Grafting is the first one. Um, first, let's talk about flowers. I'll quickly review how flowers are sexual organs. Again, this is something we've talked about before, but just to refresh your memory. Um, remember, this doesn't apply to all flowers, but most flowers have both a uh, female part, that's this part right here in the middle there, and then they have a male part, that's this part up here, these little um, brown things. Um, the little brown things produce pollen. Remember, a bee will land on the flower, they're eating the nectar down here at the base of the flower. Um, bees have little fuzzy, furry bodies. They pick up that pollen from one flower. They fly over, land on the next flower, and they deposit some of that pollen right here onto the female part here. That pollen moves its way down to where the eggs are down here. They fertilize the eggs, which makes seeds. Um, and actually, when you're eating an apple, whoops, when you're eating an apple, you're actually eating, um, see that where this says receptacle here, that, that's sort of where the seeds go. You're eating the swollen um, flesh of the apple tree, really. You're eating essentially a swollen ovary, um, which I know seems sort of weird, um, but it's, it's, a, it's actually pretty effective for a lot of plants. If you think about it, um, you know, when, when you or I eat an apple, uh, we, you know, leave the seeds and the core to the side. We don't eat that, right? But think about an apple tree out in nature. What's going to eat apples out in nature? 
maybe a deer. Okay. So does a deer eat around the core of an apple like humans do? No, the deer just eats the whole apple. Okay. They eat the seeds and all. Well, the whole point of an apple tree putting its seeds in the middle of that apple is when that deer eats that apple, okay, it takes those seeds from the apple and it walks across the forest and it poops <laughs> those seeds out and it essentially plants an apple tree somewhere far away. If all the apple tree or if, if all the apples just fell straight off the tree and fell right next to mama tree and all the apple trees were just trying to grow right underneath mama tree, Mama tree wouldn't be very happy and neither would babies, right? Because trees need light, they need sunlight. All these babies are trying to grow in the shade of mama tree. Uh, those babies are trying to suck up some of the water that mama tree wanted. So flowers are helpful for apple trees because they make seeds inside of apples that uh, essentially get their seeds further away um, to, to spread their babies out further. Anyways, sorry, y'all know I like flowers, I like plants, I like talking about this stuff. Let's talk a little bit about grafting. This is kind of an interesting process. So when we first look at this, um, a lot of people get kind of confused. You'll see this sort of cut branch and you'll see these twigs. And a lot of times people think, well, if someone cut the branch and the tree is sort of like growing out from that, but that's not quite what happened. What somebody did is they actually cut this branch off here, obviously. And they actually put some slits underneath the bark and then they took twigs from another tree and they slid them underneath that bark there. Um, kind of imagine like, well, yeah, they, they just sort of shave the edge of the twig down and shove it underneath the bark. Now, eventually what will happen, and this stuff on the end is like a waxy coating. It's kind of like a band-aid, like a tree band-aid to protect it from getting infected and stuff. Trees can get infections too. Um, so eventually the trees, the, the branch here and the twigs that they put onto it will actually heal together. Um, and then these little twigs will be a new part of this tree. Well, why the heck would anybody want to do that? That seems sort of silly, right? Cut off a branch in order to add a bunch of twigs. Well, here's the thing. Um, think about it this way. If an apple is produced sexually, right? That's going to be a combination of mom's and dad's genes. Now, remember, going back here to this flower diagram, I said this green part down here, this is essentially what gets big and swollen and you know, red if it's a red apple or whatever. And that's the part that you actually eat. So this part right here is always going to be essentially from mom flower, right? Because dad's pollen came from some other flower somewhere else. That's the pollen that made it into here. Okay. This, this little male part doesn't actually fertilize this flower here. So essentially you're eating part of this tree. Now, if you take one of these seeds, those seeds has half of the DNA of this tree and half of the DNA of whatever tree that pollen came from. Okay, so half DNA from this tree, half DNA from another. Say this apple was really delicious, okay? What you're saying is that this tree right here was delicious, essentially. The tree that produced that apple is good at making delicious apples. If you take these seeds, only half that DNA is from that good tasting tree. Okay, so if you take, if you plant those seeds, you may not get um, as good of a tasting of an apple. So what people do is they essentially take this part right here, which they know produces good apples. That's what they'll cut off and stick onto the new tree because they know that this twig makes good apples. Okay, so they're going to take that twig, put it onto this nice healthy tree. Maybe, maybe the tree is dying, right? And the, the tree that you know produces good apples, maybe that tree is dying. So before it's all the way dead, you chop off some of its twigs, put it onto a new tree so it still continues surviving. Um, that's how really most apples are produced. Now, occasionally we're going to get new varieties, right? And that's a combination of genes. People are still planting these mixture of mom and dad genes, um, you know, trees and um, seeing if they taste good. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. That's how we get new apple varieties. Um, but if you know that you want a red delicious apple tree, you essentially need to graft on red delicious apple tree twigs to what's called your rootstock. 
this this tree we know has good roots it's a good solid trunk it's healthy um, and we know that these twigs produce good fruit so we want to combine those um, so that we can get the best of both worlds it's kind of complicated um, something fun here this is all on one tree obviously we've got um, all a bunch of different colors apples by the way here's sort of your definition of grafting it's just transplanting living tissue so on back on this picture this uh, these twigs are living tissue uh, we transplanted them from whatever tree they came from we transplanted them onto uh, this tree here okay uh, what's cool I've always wanted to do this to be honest um, you can take one rootstock and put onto it I don't know, Red Delicious and Granny Smith and uh, Golden Delicious and Honey Crisp and whatever type of apple you want. You can have uh, all those apples all growing on one tree just because you grafted twigs from a variety of trees. So I think that's kind of cool. I've, this is a this is all a picture of one tree here. Um, neat stuff. All right, moving on. Bacteria. But do you think they reproduce sexually or asexually? Bacteria are strictly asexual, and they use a thing called fission, specifically binary fission. Um, you may have heard of nuclear fission. Fission basically just means cutting something in half. Nuclear fission is when you split an atom, you split the nucleus of an atom. Um, so bacterial fission is splitting a bacteria in half. It's when a single-celled organism divides into two identical daughter organisms. It's very similar to mitosis, um, making, you know, two cells out of one. Um, but bacterial cells are a little bit different than um, eukaryotic cells, so they have a slightly different process. Um, here I just showed that. Now one, one important the difference between bacteria and, so bacteria, what we're looking at here, and then, for instance, human cells, which we looked at before when we were looking at mitosis. Um, bacterial cells don't have a nucleus okay so they don't have to deal with all that remember when we were doing the thing we had the dotted line because the nucleus was dissolving and then we had a new dotted line over here because the nucleus was forming again and we had you know the chromosomes coming apart whatever bacteria don't really have chromosomes they just have one big sort of clump of dna that's called the nucleoid so that dna still replicates um but they essentially just move to opposite sides and they split in half like uh, um, telekine or tele telekinesis. Tele yes, telekinesis. <laughs> no, telephase. I knew that word was wrong. Telephase. Gosh, it's late, guys. I'm sorry. This would be telephase. This would be cytokinesis. Um, you know, these two would sort of be cytokinesis. Anyways, looks very similar to mitosis, a little bit different. Basically, it's mitosis, but bacteria do not have the nucleus to divide. Okay, uh, so that's bacterial fission. It is asexual. You have one parent, and you have two identical, we call them daughter cells. Okay, one parent, two kids. All right, I think probably the last one we're going to talk about today is the Burmese python. Uh, so what do you think? Sexual, asexual, or both? Turns out Burmese pythons can use both. So, sexually, we're not going to talk about that egg, sperm. You you know the basics of that, right? Let's talk about this thing, parthenogenesis. And if you have the printout, uh, you will have a little thing for that. Parthenogenesis literally means virgin birth. Okay, so basically what can happen normally out in the wild, Burmese python um you know would probably do the normal thing right you've got uh here's your let me make sure i'm not lying to you here okay here's your here's your egg here's your sperm comes into the egg right and you have mom represented with black here dad represented with red normally then that would create the baby right so that's your sexual reproduction of the burmese python however a lot of animals have just sort of this internal thing that says, I need to make babies. We've sort of talked about that before. Um, 
my whole point in life is to make babies. If I die without having made a baby, then, you know, that's, that's basically just not good. Right. Um, now for one, I want to say humans are different. Um, <laughs> a lot of people don't want to have babies and that's fine. That's perfectly fine in today's crazy world. Um, but animals are more for lack of a better term, animalistic, right? Um, so for a lot of animals, it's, Hey, I need to make a baby. Let's get this done. If a male isn't around to give a sperm to make a baby the quote unquote normal way. Okay. Through sexual reproduction, a female can say, all right, look, there ain't no guys around here, right? I just need to take care of this myself. I need to make a baby before I die. I'm going to die soon. Let's get this done. So instead of having half a set of DNA from mom and half a set of DNA from dad, essentially what mom does is she sort of takes two of her eggs. So half set of mom DNA, half set of mom DNA, and she combines them to make a baby with essentially two half sets of her own DNA. So her own DNA. This is basically entirely mom's DNA here. Okay. That's why it's called virgin birth because no sex actually has to happen. If you are thinking about Christianity here, no, the Virgin Mary did not do parthenogenesis. She's not a reptile. She can't do that. Okay. Um, if you want to talk about that more, you can email me. I'm going to leave it there. So that's parthenogenesis. Instead of having egg and sperm, you essentially have egg and egg come together. This is a special thing that reptiles can do. Reptiles can do some uh, interesting things. All right. We're going to cut it off there. We're going to come to cats tomorrow and we're going to finish up uh, tomorrow. All right. So um, again, write anything down in your notebook that you need to. If you got any questions on what we're doing, uh, go ahead and shoot me an email. Um, and don't forget about that challenge that I mentioned. Oops. <laughs>